Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to The Frontline, a virtual town hall of pandemic mental health impact, a World Insight special production on COVID-19. I'm your host, Tian Wei. Good to see you once again. Fear about the coronavirus has gripped the world. There are growing signs of anxiety. As I speak, more than 210,000 people have died from the virus and more than 3 million people have become sick. Hundreds of millions of people have been told to stay at home and limit their contact with the others. So how are people around the world adjusting to the new way of life? How to maintain our mental health during a global pandemic? Today, we are joined by a group of young people from different parts of the world. So are experts from around the world. They're here to share with us their insights and to share with us some of the most important experiences. Our guests will explain how to calm our anxiety during the pandemic and discuss the psychological effects of being quarantined. Let's meet the experts first. In Beijing, Han Buxin, president of Chinese Psychological Society. In Scottsdale, Arizona in the U.S., Catherine Shear, professor of psychiatry at Columbia University. She's also the founding director of the Center for Complicated Grief at the university. In Calgary, Li Xiaomao, provisional registered psychologist in private practice. In Toronto, Canada, Roger McIntyre, professor of psychiatry and pharmacological studies at the University of Toronto. What a pleasure to see all of you. I know while well, you are coping with it personally, you're also trying to help others. So tell me if we can, uh, one by one, about where you are researching on and what do you think are the most important advice we should keep in mind. Let's start from Toronto. Uh, Professor McIntyre. Well, you know, you've cited some statistics with respect to the number of people we know to be a affected by the uh, COVID-19 as well as the deaths. And we've been talking a lot about flattening the curves. What we need to talk about is preventing the curves, the curve of suicide, and the curve of mental illness that's associated with suicide, like depression, a variety of anxiety-related conditions, including post-traumatic stress, which is related to anxiety, as well as alcohol-related problems. The world has never witnessed a triple threat quite like this. The triple threat is the biomedical threat of the virus. Secondly, it is the financial insecurity and the employment insecurity mm -hmm. as a consequence of the government reaction to this. And thirdly is the quarantine measures. Whether we're talking about the anxiety of the virus, whether we're talking about income and employment insecurity, mm -hmm. and or we're talking about quarantine, all of these are hazardous to brain health. We know from history, whether we go back to the SARS epidemic, which affected Toronto more than any other city outside Toronto, uh, Asia, mm. we witnessed hazardous effects of, for example, quarantine, high rates of depression, post-traumatic stress and substance abuse. So we've said a lot about healthcare providers. I'm a healthcare provider. I work yes. frontline. This is a very difficult time, but it's also very difficult for a lot of other groups in society, like those who have mental illness, mm. those who are on the fringe of society because of economics, and certainly the general population at large. Right. It's very important you talk about the three areas, about the virus, about the economic uh, realities, and also about the quarantine life. That's having huge impact on people's mental health. I want to go to you uh, also, uh, Professor Shear from uh, uh, Arizona. Tell me more about what you are looking at most closely. Though I'm physically in, in Arizona, my work is all at Columbia University in in um, New York City. That's one of the uh, quirks, I guess, of our current world, yeah. is that we often are in more than one place at, at a time. Um, and I, I certainly think that these triple threat, as, as my colleague um, defined them, are highly important. But I would like to add to that, and, and something that is almost always neglected in the mental health field, and kind of surprisingly so, and that is the fact that more than millions of people are dying from this virus as well. And they're, in addition to the people that are dying, when people die, they leave behind bereaved people 
who suffer enormously and who have a very high, also a very high rate yeah. of mental disorders, particularly when the death occurs in the way that it does with this virus. So that's my work centers on um, helping people who really can't get past grief. So that's, that's what I do. That's what I've done for many, many years now. And it's what I'm doing now. And, the, and I think it's really important to add that to the list of things to be concerned about with this virus. That's right. Professor Shea, if I could just follow up very briefly. So what do you think are some of the most important tools we could have in mind uh, that we know who are experiencing this difficulty at home or in the workplace? So what would be the best way to deal with it now? Well, I think in the beginning, when someone, when, when you lose someone close, it's going to be essentially, it's like an earthquake, really, that kind of shakes the very foundation of your being. It, we, we experience, we typically experience acute grief that is um, something that surprises many people in its forcefulness and the way that it takes, it can take over our lives. Mm -hmm. And then we move through that by basically finding a way to, to really accept the reality of that loss because it's not easy to do that in the beginning. And then we also have to kind of regroup and, and move forward, yeah. re, sort of restore a sense of well-being ourselves. And that can happen in a variety of ways. So the main thing is to, to understand that this is all very natural and to allow yourself to grieve in the way that you need to. So I can say more about that later. in China, even though the curve has already flattened, in fact, the country has almost uh, going to the normalcy, quote unquote, there are a lot of psychological burdens everyone here is trying to deal with. So, Miss Lee, tell me more about how you are doing it because you are doing the private practice. What are the patients yeah. you are facing and what are the, the stories you are hearing and what do you think how you can relate to your earlier colleagues who are talking about grief and also three layers of uh, psychological pressure to deal with? Yeah, and because I work at private practice, so my experience is that everyone is affected. And what my client told me is always about the coronavirus. And in the past, uh, typically when we greet, uh, we would have an update about people's life. How was your mood for the past week? But currently, whenever we greet each other, and people would mention, oh, they like learn or heard something about the coronavirus news and the worry about their family. Mm. So the entire conversation kind of changed and towards in that direction. Mm. And like for clients, it is a very difficult time for them because like when they seek psychotherapy or psycho counseling, they already have so many things on their plate. So the coronavirus just added another thing to worry in their plate. So it would cause more stress and very difficult to cope. And they may encounter insurance issues, financial issues, losing their jobs. And some of them, uh, some of them mentioned they don't trust of the online therapy. And if they have family members at home, it is very difficult for them to like be open and to communicate with a therapist right. because they worry their family members would hear them. And some of them would also mention and they worry about their family members. Um, they not mm -hmm. only about themselves getting the virus, but also about uh, what if my family member get the virus? How can I? best support them. Mm. So it's very difficult taking care of so many things in their lives already and at the same time they have to learn how to build right. up their 
problems and be connected with other people and learn the ability to cope. Well, it's easier said than done, isn't it? We could uh, line up this laundry list of things that they can do, but however, how to do it, that's usually the most difficult part. I will have all of you to explain about that. But first of all, let's go to uh, Professor Shear. Since you're working in New York, and New York is what place of epicenter for the United States, now we see the number is going still high. Flattening the curve, uh, that has been achieved, but uh, the number is still going up and we all know things are still going exponentially. So, in the middle of all of this, what do you think are the things that people could do in order to calm down and face the reality to be the first step? So, uh, I think it's very important to recognize that feeling um, anxiety and feeling lonely and the, some of the difficult feelings that we have in our lives are natural in this circumstance. And the, you know, and the main thing is not to, is to be, well, two things, to be um, compassionate to oneself in feeling these things, so not to layer on, so to speak, some kind of judgment about whether, you know, what are you feeling, what you should be feeling, are you feeling, you know, should you not have these feelings? Mm. And then also to at the same time to stay kind of in the moment and not to not to overdo it either not to sort of um, just catastrophize about all the the things that could go wrong really to try to stay in the present and and to remember that the even though things are still not looking so good in New York they are better than they were a few weeks ago mm -hmm. and that's that's the general pattern we will get through this and we'll you know, we need to support one another, and that's going on. There's a lot of that going on. And we need to reach out to other people to be of help to them and to let them help right. us. Let me go to you also, Professor McIntyre. Uh, we have been seeing healthcare workers on the very front line dealing with the death of their patients and the incapability of their trade to deal with the pandemic in such a scale. And we also have been hearing even suicidal stories of these doctors and healthcare workers. Now, for them, what are some of the things they need to bear in mind? And also for the others who are dealing with them, whether families, acquaintances, you know, or colleagues, what are some of the things we need to bear in mind? Well, I think the comments about bereaved or people who've gone through loss and, and, and of a loved one is, in many ways, there's a lot of similarities. I think we're talking about a stressor, uh, and the healthcare providers are now being subjected to, uh, yes, uh, death and, and loss of, of uh, patients. Mm -hmm. There's also the fear they might contract the virus and pass it on to their patients. This is something that's been expressed to me by some colleagues that work in my hospital. Uh, there's also in many cases, depends on which part of the world, but many healthcare providers are being asked to work in areas that they're not experts in because there's been the need to redeploy yes. some of the uh, human resources. According to the World Health Organization, 80% of the world's uh, healthcare workforce is women. Yeah. And I think that's something we need to be very sensitive to as well. I think women are carrying a disproportionate amount of this, uh, this burden. And, but what's different now is that healthcare providers are being asked to in case, uh, quarantine or socially distance, certainly physically distance themselves, not just from their colleagues, but also from their families. And many families are healthcare providers are not even staying at their homes with their families out of concern that they might be affected and not know it. Mm. So look, this, this is obviously a difficult time, but I want to be very clear, there are, there are solutions mm. like having structure to your day. We just finished a study in the south of China which um, has, uh, just, is going to come out in press in the American Journal of Psychiatry in a few weeks. And we looked at healthcare providers, and it won't surprise you that they had a lot of depression, a no. lot of anxiety, mm. a lot of stress. But here's what was interesting, portion control. Mm -hmm. We found that healthcare providers that spent too much time watching TV, three, four, five hours a day, or too much time on social media, three, four, five hours a day, reported much higher degrees of stress and anxiety. Mm. So portion control usually means food and alcohol consumption, 
It also means news media and social media consumption. Mm -hmm. And we think this, along with accurate information, getting good sleep and exercise, are all ways to build your resiliency and maintain contact mm. with your colleagues through some of the uh, technology platforms. Mm. What you have just said is so true that the media and also the public uh, uh, domain and platform not only should be about the latest news but also to provide health advice and support to our viewers. That's exactly what we are trying to do. And by the way, we've been having our viewers trying to write in and also post our comments on our uh, YouTube channels, uh, Twitter and Facebook accounts. So I want to read one. Yet again, thank you to all frontline responders for fighting and protecting the country and people amid the pandemic. So we want to thank you as well. This is one of our viewers writing in. Having said that, though, let me go to uh, Mr. Han in Beijing. Would you like to help us to understand what's going on here in China? Uh, because it was first in the fire and almost the first coming out of the fire compared to the other peer countries. So now, what are some of the biggest psychological difficulties the population is dealing with? In China, the pandemic has get into second phase. So psychological reaction has been emerged. Uh, for psychologists in China, uh, the first priority is to find those really in need especially for those workers in frontier and in front line, uh, medical doctors, nurses, uh, and also uh, community workers, patients and their relatives, especially those uh, relatives with uh, uh, they lost their beloved ones. Mm. So uh, tell me, because China experiences in a different way. The epicenter of Wuhan, that's where most of the lives lost. The rest of China was, in a way, looking at Wuhan and also worry about what they are trying to deal with. So this is a very different uh, reality than some of the other countries where they have outbreaks in different parts of the map. So uh, what does that mean, Mr. Han, for people inside Wuhan? Uh, the epicenter, and for people outside Wuhan, I guess it's very different stories. Psychologists have found the phenomenon called um, a typhoon, uh, psychological typhoon eyes reaction mm. to the uh, crisis like this. Uh, this has been in the last time when the Wen China outbreak. Uh, people living in the epicenter are not really actually react as um, anxiety as people expected because they experience the um, crisis already, they know the reality. Rather than outside the epicenter, for example, people living in Beijing, they just know the news from the media. So their mental and behavioral reaction may be severe than, the, I mean, negative reaction may be severe than those living um, epicenter. Yeah, today we're dealing with the psychological trauma that we are all facing today as a result of COVID-19. Well, so what steps can be taken to help reave, re re uh, in a way, families and beloved ones? And how can they manage their grief as they begin their difficult times? Let's take a look at this package. Psychologists explain that there is a peak and a valley response in our nerve system when faced with trauma. Right now, we are at the peak in which we are engaging with the immediate threat of the pandemic. You go into survival mode, which can be very taxing on a person's mental health. Once the pandemic is over, there will be a valley where we recover from that threat. But the problem is, going back to the baseline without support can take a lot longer than we may think. After the threat passes, people can start to retreat or fall into depression, or find many other ways of disassociating themselves with the trauma they experienced. That's an interesting roundup. You're watching our special program, The Frontline, a virtual town hall on pandemic mental health impacts. Stay with us. We'll be back after this.